Right. Welcome to the second session today. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Yen Ting Lin. Over to you. You have 25 minutes. Good morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you something that has bothered me for the past 14 years, namely the uh, lack of redshift evolution uh, in the total stellar mass cluster mass relation. In addition, after hearing Ben's talk on the um, for modeling technique fork yesterday, uh, I decided to uh, also talk about detecting assembly bias uh, as a appli potential application of such four modeling uh, methods, and I will show you some very preliminary results. So let me jump right in to the first part of my talk, the total stellar mass cluster mass relation. Uh, back in 2004, uh, Professor Moore and I were among the first to show a tight correlation between the total uh, near infrared K band luminosity and cluster mass. Since the K band light is a good proxy of stellar mass, this effectively is a correlation between the total stellar mass and cluster mass. We found that the total luminosity or stellar mass goes as cluster mass to 0.7 power. And this means that um, the clusters are not self similar. Basically, you cannot build massive clusters simply by combining many lower mass ones together. If you divide both sides by mass, you see that the uh, stellar mass per unit halo mass uh, decreases with cluster mass. And what's the cause of this? Perhaps there is a lot of tidal stripping that converts an initially linear relation into a sublinear one and, let, and liberates a lot of stars into the intracluster space. And so we would expect a large fraction of intracluster light in terms of the cluster baryon budget. Another possibility is, the, is perhaps that the progenitors uh, of the low Z high mass clusters, namely the lower mass clusters at higher redshift, are different uh, in terms of the stellar to total ratio from their low Z low mass counterparts. And this will have interesting implications uh, as illustrated here. Uh, this is a cartoon showing the um, formation or buildup of clusters over time. We have the uh, highest mass clusters here and lowest mass clusters here at redshift zero. Observations tell us, tell us that uh, this guy has the sm smallest stellar to total mass ratio, while this one has the largest ratio. If their progenitors inherit this uh, stellar to total ratios, then uh, we will expect a redshift evolution uh, in the stellar to total uh, correlation. So at low redshift, it may be uh, like this, but at high redshift, um, the slope and the amplitude will both change. Since the mass growth history of the halos for high and low mass uh, objects are expected to be different. Uh, perhaps more interestingly is that this also implies a varying galaxy formation efficiency as a function of present day cluster mass. Somehow a halo at high redshift has to know what or where they will end up with to determine at what rate or efficiency uh, it will turn its baryons into stars. So this is very uh, difficult for me to comprehend. And to get to the bottom of this, um, we need to study the redshift evolution of such scaling relations. And so uh, back in 2006 and 2012, I used two different cluster samples uh, to address this issue out to redshift 0.6 or so. Um, I assumed the, uh, a simple uh, redshift evolution factor in, turn, uh, in the form of power law. Basically, the stellar mass goes as plus the mass to some power times one plus z to a gamma factor. For both studies, we found that gamma uh, was consistent with zero, but because of the limited sample size, uh, we cannot really constrain gamma very tightly. Since 2008, uh, I have been involved with the Subaru Hypersubprime Camp Survey. Uh, and now, more than 10 years later, 
we finally have uh, constructed large samples of clusters, and I was very eager to see what HSC has to say about the redshift evolution of this scaling relation. Uh, so Ruth already uh, gave, uh, gave you an introduction to the survey uh, yesterday. I just want to emphasize the large field of view of the camera, which can capture the whole of Andromeda galaxy in one shot. So that allows us to uh, survey the sky very efficiently. The um, HSC survey consists of a wide, deep, and ultra-deep component uh, to I of 26, 27, and 28 magnitude, uh, covering 1,426 and 3.5 square degrees, respectively. Uh, so in this parameter space of depth plus area, we are located here in a very good position in this uh, parameter space, only to be surpassed by LSST, perhaps in five years of time, as it gradually builds up its depths. Um, I want to also stress that HSC is not just yet another imaging survey. Two important aspects distinguish this from other uh, ongoing or even future surveys, which are superb imaging quality. Uh, our median C in the I-band is 0.6 arc seconds, as you mentioned. So this allows us to discover something like this, a double lens system, basically three objects lying almost perfectly along the line of sight. Uh, so you can see an Einstein ring and an, a strong arc. Ken was involved in the discovery and characterization of this system. Uh, we are also able to uh, dis discover things like this. Uh, in the poor, poor imaging quality uh, CFHT legacy survey, uh, you don't really know what this is. Uh, with the HSC data, uh, if the light can be dimmed a little bit, um, you can clearly see, uh, you cannot yet. <laughs> You can imagine um, uh, a star-forming ring surrounding a massive galaxy in the center of a cluster at redshift one. Uh, so we may be witnessing the uh, star formation or star bursting phase of a, a massive BCG by redshift zero. So because of all these aspects, um, we can conduct complete census of clusters at uh, the key phases of their lives. Uh, including their infancy, namely polo clusters uh, at redshift four to six using uh, the Lyman break technology uh, technique, um, as well as uh, the forming phase at redshift one to two, uh, we can use the broad and narrow band filters to study the star formation activity, and and into the maturity at redshift less than one, as you. As Joe mentioned, we can use the presence of red sequence to identify clusters. A final remark is that uh, the first batch of the HSC data has become public in February 2017, and the next one uh, will occur in May this year, so please stay tuned. Um, I cannot resist showing an unfair comparison between uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, oh, thank you, and uh, HSC. So these are three low redshift clusters, uh, as seen by, the, by Sloan, using the Navigate tool that we use every day. And this is what HSC reveals to us. It's like the universe has suddenly lit up. So uh, with this kind of data, uh, we have used the multiband red sequence cluster finding algorithm, Chimera, um, and applied it to, to the HSC data. Uh, for the first batch of HSC data covering 230 square degrees, we have found nearly 2,000 clusters out to redshift 1.1 uh, with mass roughly above 10 to 14 solar masses. And this shows um, our richest clusters, uh, cluster at redshift 0.8 and 1.06. So this is the uh, parent cluster sample that I will use. Um, and here's a breakdown of the key elements that lead to, the, lead to our result, namely the construction of stellar mass cluster mass relation. Uh, on the stellar mass side, for individual galaxies, we derive the stellar mass using a machine learning algorithm. And then uh, by stacking clusters together, we can build composite stellar mass distribution uh, using statistical background correction scheme. 
And then by integrating the stellar mass distribution, we can obtain the total stellar mass content that will be shown on the y-axis. On the cluster side, um, we, we, we want to build cluster samples that can be considered to form an evolutionary sequence. Uh, that is, uh, the high z cluster sample that we use should have properties consistent with the progenitors of the low z cluster samples. And for this, we use the, to, uh, the top n selection method. And uh, to infer the mean cluster mass, we use uh, both weak lensing and uh, um, cluster abundance based uh, osmets. I'll go through this in turn. The top end selection uh, allows us to construct cluster samples that represent progenitor descendant relationships in a st statistical sense. Uh, and it follows the ansatz that given a co moving volume, uh, the most massive n halos will remain among the most massive n at a later time. And we have used the Melanian simulation to test how good this ansatz is. Uh, we have four redshift bins from redshift 0.3 to 1, uh, each occupying the same co moving volume. Um, and so we found that for top 100 clusters selected at redshift 0.98, once we assume a 25% scatter in the mass observable relation, seems we cannot select clusters by their mass yet. Um, about 60 to 65% of, the, of these clusters will, will remain among the top 100. So this fraction may, seem, may not seem very high to you, uh, but we have used the semi-analytic models from Millennium to show that uh, we can still very faithfully uh, recover the evolution of the stellar mass distrib distribution with such a top 100 selection. So we have confidence in the stellar mass content that we derive. But feel free to ask me uh, questions about this later. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we use both stack weak lensing and also uh, the, the number or abundance of clusters to determine or estimate the cluster mass. Uh, both give consistent results, uh, and we found that our clusters at redshift one have typical masses about two times 10 to 14. And by redshift 0.4, uh, they have grown to about four times 10 to 14. And um, our projection is that by redshift zero, these clusters will evolve into clusters with mass uh, between six to, time, six, 6 to 10 times 10 to 14 solar masses. So we are talking about progenitors of present-day massive clusters here. Um, in terms of stellar mass estimates, uh, because for galaxies at ratio greater than 0.8, the HSC GRIZY photometry doesn't really sample much of the rest brain optical. So using traditional SED-based fitting, uh, SDD fitting uh, based estimates, will result in biases. And so uh, we decided to use a machine learning algorithm called DAMP uh, to derive the stellar mass, which is basically a hybrid of linear regression and nearest neighbor uh, methods. We use the Cosmos catalog uh, as a training set and uh, apply the trained network to the HSC-wide data. And uh, the comparison uh, with the Cosmos stellar mass shows that our Usmates are unbiased and the scatter is low, and we are highly complete above a stellar mass of 10 to 10 solar masses. Um, so we can finally derive the stellar mass distribution, and uh, in each of these panels, I showed a pairwise comparison of stellar mass distri distributions in two different redshift bins, uh, say 0.96 to 0.5. A4, 0.842.69, etc. Uh, let me just focus on a comparison between our highest and lowest redshift bins. Uh, here, the solid histograms are for our uh, the the redshift 0.45 bin. Uh, the dashed ones are for the 0.96 bin, and the red and blue uh, colors are for red and blue galaxies. Uh, it can be seen that um, at both High mass and low mass ends, there is significant growth in terms of abundance of galaxies, uh, except for the disappearance of very massive blue galaxies. 
from highest redshift to lower redshift. Um, for red galaxies above 10 to 10 solar masses, the abundance have increased uh, uh, two times between these two epochs. And for the lower mass red galaxies, the increase in abundance is even higher, seven times. So this is a manifestation of the downsizing effect. And by integrating the stellar mass distribution down to 10 to 10 solar masses, where we are highly complete, uh, we can uh, obtain the total stellar mass content, uh, mGAL, which is shown on the y-axis, and we compare that to our cluster mass, USMEDS. The color symbols uh, represent our cluster samples at four different redshift bins. Uh, the red is, at our low, uh, is our lowest redshift, and the blue being the highest redshift. Since our cluster samples are constructed such that they presumably form an evolutionary sequence, we can see how clusters move in this plane. So they move this way, surprisingly. Um, and they are very well described by this pink solid line, which is, um, a, which is described by a stellar mass going as cluster mass to 0.7 power. Uh, I should say that this is not a fit to the data points, but rather taken from this earlier study of mine using a completely different cluster sample at redshift between 0 and 0.6. So the best fit of this sample describes this, uh, the current cluster sample very well. So combined together, uh, basically uh, we, sh we have shown that there is no redshift evolution in this stellar mass cluster mass relation out to redshift 1. So why is there no evolution? Well, for uh, every unit of, uh, to reproduce what we have observed here, for every unit of dark matter you accrete onto a cluster, uh, you can only increase the stellar mass content in galaxies by half of what you naively uh, would expect. And that, again, implies a lot of tidal stripping. Or you could prefer, uh, preferentially accrete uh, objects with, with high st uh, stellar to light ratio, high mass to light ratio, uh, so that you move this way. This is the stellar to total ratio. Whichever ways you do it, you have to uh, do it at all redshifts. So this seems highly non-trivial to me. Um, to try to understand this behavior, uh, we have a simple-minded model. So basically, we took the merger trees from, of massive halos from Millennium. For every halo that forms, we assign some stellar mass to it, assuming a simple stellar mass to halo mass relation. When two halos merge, um, some fraction of the stellar mass is assumed to, to be lost into the intrahalo or interhalo space, so we cannot observe them anymore. We found that through reproduce the slope of 0.7, uh, a large fraction of stars have to be lost, like 40%. And even so, with this extreme uh, model, we cannot reproduce the constancy in the amplitude of this relation. So this dash curve showed the model predictions from this simple model. So uh, between redshift 1 and 0, it changes by a factor of 2 or so. So I'm still very puzzled uh, about the constancy, or sorry, time invariance of the stellar mass halo mass relation. And I want to emphasize that this is not just seen by us, but also from an SPT selected cluster sample done by Ino Chu and Joe, as well as the group, groups from, uh, from the cosmos field as done by Jodini et al. So if you have good ideas, please share with me. and, and I would really love to push this kind of study to a higher redshift. Um, so that's basically what I want to say about the cluster studies from HSC today. Uh, but obviously the data set is very rich and that will allow us to study many different other aspects. Uh, I will just mention two possibilities. The first one is this study by Miyazaki et al, uh, where they have presented, a, to my knowledge, uh, the largest shear-selected cluster sample to date uh, with 65 
uh, uh, shear mass peaks uh, over a large area of the sky. And we also have about 180 proto cluster candidates at Redshift uh, 4 uh, selected as um, Lyman Bray galaxy over densities. So this will allow us to study the cluster evolution uh, in an unprecedented way. Uh, this workshop is about the next decade, uh, so I will very briefly comment on how we may uh, move forward. So I want to push the cluster studies to higher redshift, say greater than 1.4, with a large and homogeneously selected sample. So obviously there is EROSITA and next generation SE surveys. There will also be LSST, Euclid, WFIRST, and also super prime focus spectrograph PFS survey. Um, it seems that the, uh, with the near infrared coverage, Euclid uh, is the most promising to deliver such a sample. Well, I want to say that PFS also offers a complementary uh, approach by targeting uh, over densities selected from emission line galaxies uh, from our cosmology survey. And also we can build groups and clusters from our JBAN selected densely sampled uh, spectroscopic sample from our galaxy evolution survey. If you are interested in the PFS survey, I'll, I'll be happy to answer more questions about it. But now let me switch gears to uh, talk about uh, assembly bias detection. Uh, what is assembly bias? We know that dark matter halo bias is, pre uh, is primarily a function of halo mass. So it's low at low mass end, but becomes high quickly at high mass end. Um, with, large, with the advent of large simulations like Millennium, it was discovered that bias also depends on other halo properties like formation time, and this is known as assembly bias. Uh, this shows the spatial distribution of uh, halos with 10 to 11 solar masses, uh, but this shows the distribution for the youngest 20%, and this is the oldest 20%. So you see that their clustering properties are very different. So for such low mass halos, uh, those that form earlier would cluster more strongly uh, with about 40% larger bias than the later forming ones. And for cluster scale halos, then the amplitude is expected to be smaller. And um, soon after the discovery of assembly bias in simulations, Yang et al. claimed the first detection in 2006. Basically, they, took, uh, they used a catalog that classifies galaxies into single and multiple galactic systems. They further designated uh, the galaxies into central and satellites. And further, they assign halo masses to these systems using something similar to abundance matching. They further made the assumption that the formation history of the central galaxies would be closely related to that of the halos. And they found that halos with currently passive centrals have larger bias than those with star-forming centrals of the same halo mass. So if we can identify passiveness with old age and star formation activity with young age, then this is assembly bias. But we have uh, followed their approach uh, and indeed confirmed that halos with currently low specific star formation rate centrals do cluster more strongly than those with uh, high SSFR ones. Uh, this shows the correlation function measurements and this is the relative bias. But we found that this can all be attributed to the difference in their masses. So this is not assembly bias. And with a more careful treatment, which I will skip now, uh, we do not find any convincing evidence for assembly bias. And let me move on to the cluster scale assembly bias. Um, the key here is to identify the proxy of formation time. Concentration may work, but it's difficult to measure on an individual cluster basis. The dream will come true if we have the accretion history of individual clusters. And now this can be done with this illicit simulation done by Wang et al. And basically they have created a constraint simulation of the local Sloan volume. Um, and um, 
for structures larger than two megaparsecs, there is a very co good correspondence between the Sloan large-scale structure and clusters with the illicit simulation. So basically, uh, we can take the real clusters and find the counterparts in the simulation and use the mass growth history of the simulated halos as, the course, uh, as that of the real clusters. And by splitting clusters by Z20, that is the redshift, when 20% of the final mass is assembled, uh, we can consider the oldest and youngest 170 clusters. And we found that their lensing masses are comparable, but their large scale clustering uh, strengths are very different. Uh, the, for the two samples to be consistent, the probability is only 10 to the minus four. So this, I think, is an interesting uh, evidence for assembly bias, although we are still checking the consistency with lambda CDM predictions. So since our, uh, I'm running out of time, uh, I'll just leave my conclusion here. And thank you for your attention. We have time for questions. Uh, okay, regarding the uh, stellar mass halo mass relation, can you tell us some words about the role, uh, role of intercluster light, how you do account for it? Uh, we didn't. Right. Okay. So uh, we only count galaxies more massive than 10 to a 10. And so, uh, indeed, we, we intend to include this contribution uh, for the, to see if, if we can see any evolution. Yes, yeah. do you, because the intercluster light should build from redshift one to redshift zero from simulations and from other arguments. So a lot of mass may be hidden in that uh, in uh, intercluster light, though 40% of total mass is pretty high as a figure. Right, so, so indeed, uh, the existing studies um, I don't think they have found this kind of extreme fraction of light contained in the intracluster space. So uh, we'll see. We, we are working hard on detecting ICL uh, in the HSC. Uh, so for the assembly bias stuff that you were talking about, so you took the most massive clusters, mapped them onto the elucid counterparts, got the mass accretion history from the elucid simulations, top 20%, bottom 20%, then you looked at the bias ratios. Exactly. How does the bias ratio from the data compare to the same thing calculated from the simulation? Uh, yes, that's a good point, and, and that's a work in progress. Uh, I, I, I was just very uh, keen in showing the, this very preliminary results, but yes. But simply taking at the face value, these two samples have very different clustering uh, strengths. So I think uh, for some people, this will be assembly bias already. Yeah, maybe uh, just a comment. Yeah, it's very interesting, the assembly bias results. So um, there was a recent paper by Yao, Yuan Mao, and uh, Risa and all. So they, they said that they found that the uh, that the assembly bias signals is less correlated with like say the T half or the half, ma uh, yeah, half mass age or something like that. So the formation history, the signal is very small. So do you think like this is probably much larger than what you're thinking? So, uh, so there's a paper by Neil Dalau and his group uh, where they examine Z20, Z50 and Z80. And um, they, it seems that Z, the, the back. correlation this... for Z50 or Z half is kind of a coincidence. If we use Z80 or Z20, we can get much higher signal, and that's why I, I chose it here. Uh, if I, I, I certainly can try Z, uh, we have tried Z50, and indeed the signal is weaker. Oh, okay, yeah, right, okay, thanks. Yeah. And presenting the best case here. Right. Thanks. All right, I think uh, let's move on to the next speaker.